Amen. Glory to God. While you're standing, would you turn to John, the 20th chapter? John chapter 20, starting in verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Thomas wasn't in church with the rest of them. I don't know what was going on, but he wasn't there. And because he wasn't there, he didn't believe. There's there's a faith that comes from just being in church, folks. You know, you know God can do it, but unless you have enough faith to believe, it can't happen. Then he say, saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold thy hands. And reach hither thy hands, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God, my supreme authority, one and the same. I know who you are because I touched you. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I don't know what they were, but there were some incredible things that Jesus did and, and Thomas and all of the apostles experienced these things. But they experienced them before Jesus went to Calvary. And yet, Thomas had the feel, the nail prints, and his side. You may be seated. Oh, if we could just have had some experience like Thomas. If I could just, if I could just touch him, if I, if I could just meet him face to face, and as soon as Thomas touched Jesus, he realized the resurrection, and he realized who he was dealing with. There's so many people who will never know who Jesus is because they've never been touched by Jesus. He was the supreme authority. We have to have a personal experience with God in order to enjoy our relationship with God. You don't have a, uh, uh, an experience with strangers. You don't have any joy with strangers. You have joy and happiness and contentment with people that you know the most, you see. So in order to really enjoy the relationship, you've got to get close to our God. And by all means, God desperately wants us to enjoy him. It's his whole purpose. He, he just didn't come to save us and then just leave us someplace. He, he came so he could interact with us and that we could enjoy his presence. That's what we did tonight. We enjoyed the presence of God through our singing. What if we could have a, an experience like Moses did with a burning bush and, and a voice that came out of the the bush. Wow. Wouldn't that have been incredible? Well, wow, that would bring me close to God, you know? Um, I've been living for God all these years, and God, where's my burning bush? Where's yours? How come I never had an experience like Moses had? And I never was able to physically touch the body of Christ. The experience Moses had was outside of him, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost is inside of us. See, it's much greater than some external thing that happens out there because we have God living inside. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. We have a a more real experience with God than Moses had or even John had. Jesus said, I've been with you and you experienced all these miracles that I did. But in a few days, you will know me even better, more intimately than just the experiences You see, the burning bush didn't keep burning, 
but it met a need for the moment. And then it just went out. Never to light again. No other, no other uh, passage in the Bible that talks about the, the second burning bush or somebody else who saw a burning bush. The Holy Ghost is, is somewhat like the burning bush. It is the power and the fire of God that gives us that surge of divine power and direction, you see. Hallelujah. It, it arrests our attention. There, there's nothing like it. It is a supernatural experience much greater than the burning bush or touching Jesus' body because it lasts. It doesn't go out. <laughs> it's not temporary. I'll just be with you for a little while. No, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Just hear me. But if it won't stay lit, I'm talking about the fire that God puts in us unless we feed it like a natural fire. You know, it's so obvious, uh, I've had a wood-burning fireplace uh, for years. I cut wood and chainsaws and all of that kind of thing and dragged it in the house, and, and it was nice. I now turned it into a gas fire because I'm lazy. <laughs> but it's not like the natural fire. But I recognize that if, if I don't keep putting logs on it, it's going out, you know? We can't live on the initial run of the first experience that we had. It's like trying to get too many miles out of one tank of gas. It just won't work. You'll get to the place where you're stalled someplace. You know? I said to my wife this afternoon, I need gas, but it's just too cold. I'm not going to stop for gas, you know? <laughs> But I don't know what the temperature is going to be like tomorrow, but I know what I'll have to do. I have to stop for gas, you know. Well, I'd like to go to church, but mm, I'm really kind of tired. But you better stop, get to the house of the Lord before you run out of gas, you see, before your fire goes out. It's not like God has, has left us. It's that the fire is going out if we don't continue to refuel what God put in us in the first place. Like Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift that is within you, you see. It needs to be refueled with prayer and worship and word study and interaction with other believers. We need each other in order to get refueled and, and surged with more zeal, you see. It all is necessary to keep the burning bush inside of us alive. They're all shadows and types of, of what the Old Testament have, but we've got a whole lot better than the Old Testament, folks. Moses' initial experience was enough to motivate him to change his lifestyle. And our initial experience with receiving the Holy Ghost was enough to motivate us and change our lifestyle. But how many countless people have had that experience, but they never refueled the experience, and the fire went out? God gave him a, a little stick, Moses, you know, and, um, and turned it into a snake, and with that one experience, he was able to confront Pharaoh and evil powers. The little staff that he had, the thing that he leaned on all of those years, 40 years of backside in the desert, he said, hey, I'll take something that you've been leaning on, and I'm going to turn it into something that is miraculous. And with his experience came a promise and I shall be with you. I'm never going to leave you. It was enough to motivate him that, you know, if you can do this, God, I can lead people out of bondage. Every time there's a miracle in the church, it should be enough to say, hey, I can take care of you. I can bring somebody else out of bondage as well. More confirmation as well as confrontation. Take a look at Exodus, the 33rd chapter. In verse number 12. 
And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou saith unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, look at that, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Listen, if God's not with me, (laughs) I don't want to be there. I don't want to do that, you see. And then verse number 18, it says, and he said, I beseech thee, I beg you, Show me thy glory. You see, the only way I can really know you is for you to show me your glory, your goodness, your power, your virtue, you see. Why did Moses ask God to show him glory? This was shortly after the golden calf incidents where he was just completely... um, down because these people in a short period of time decided I'm not going to live for God. Why don't we make ourselves a God, you know? Moses is saying, Lord, I thank you for the initial experience with you, and I, and I thank you for uh, that incredible experience with the burning bush. That, that, that was just absolutely outstanding, and oh, oh that, that stick that you gave me, that, that was cool, man, that was really cool. And, and that leprosy thing, that trick with the putting of the hand in and out, the leprosy's gone, I, I like that a lot, but now... <laughs> Listen, if I'm going to take your people out of bondage, I need more than tricks. I need more than miracles. I need more than a burning bush, you see. I got to know who you are. You got to show me. I want to see your glory. I want to know that you're going to be with me, you see. It's the same question we ask. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I've seen the miracles in the church, but down the road, I need some deliverance. I need to know, God, that you're going to be with me in thick and thin, in confrontations and confirmation, you see. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But now to take this people into the promised land, well, I, I need to know you on a personal level. Here's the problem. You can come into the church and experience God's miracle and be filled with the Holy Ghost and never know God on a personal level. You can go through all of your life, coming to church, doing the things that we do, and still not know God on a personal level. Moses is saying, I I know you on a level of how you can deal with the enemy. I've seen that happen, but I want to know you. I really want to know you. I want to see more of you. I want to see something that nobody else has seen. Maybe those people down there, they don't care about you at all, but I do, you see. You see, our initial experience like Moses was to deliver us out of bondage and give us power over the enemy and over this flesh, but it's not enough. It's not enough. You can't live on what happened 40 years ago or 20 years ago or six months ago. If if that's all you've got, you're not going to make it. But that isn't enough. Now I need to know you for myself. Show me your glory. If there was ever a request that God wanted to answer, it was that. You want to know me? Nobody else seems to want to know me, you see. They want what I can give them, but do they really want to know me? You see, there's, there's the difference. You want to know me, Moses? It's like what Jesus said uh, um, in Matthew 16 and 15, but whom say you that I am? 
Oh, you've seen all of the miracles. I, I, I've fed with fishes and loaves. I, I've delivered. I've cast out. I've raised the dead. But, but here, let's get down to where it really is. Who do you think I am? Do you really know me? You've seen all of the miracles and the deliverance, but do you really know who I am? God said to Moses, if you want to see my glory or to know who I really am, then you need to come up higher by yourself. He went up to the mountain by himself. Joshua, you stay down here. Congregation, it's nice that we get together, but if you really want to get personal with God, it's not going to be in the congregation. It's going to be all by yourself. You have to climb a little bit. You got to get to the place where, oh God, could you show me your glory? Okay, but then you're going to have to, you notice that, that God didn't come down the mountain, but Moses had to go up the mountain. Hallelujah. You could say, thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for washing away my sins in baptism in Jesus' name. For all of the miracles that I've seen, and there's countless of miracles in this church, for, for your provision in my life. I've seen it happen over and over, where you've always provided for me, for your protection, the accident that I never went through, and your blessings on my life. But I am hungry to know you better. If you really feel this way, you want the same thing Moses asked for, what are you willing to do? What are we willing to do? If we're not careful, we'll say, well, I'll go to church. I'll listen to the sermons. I'll sing the songs. I'll, I'll pray and I'll wait. But that won't get it. That's just the basics. But when you really want to know him, you want to see his glory, it's going to take some personal effort to get into his presence and let him show you some things that you've never seen before. You know what I'm talking about. Most everyone knows when you've been all by yourself and all of a sudden, sometimes you're not even thinking about God, and then all of a sudden, God allows you to feel his presence. The promise of God are, are not self-fulfilling. We have to go after them. Oh, this book is full of promises for each and every one of us, but they, do, they don't just land on us. We got to go after them, you know? God, could you bring rain today? You ought to Get your umbrella out. Show him that you believe that he's going to do something for you. God, would you heal her? Well, then maybe you need to go and pray for her or him, you see. They're not self-fulfilling. If my people who are called by name, if my people who are called by name will pray, will worship, will seek my face, all contingent on doing something, you see, not just waiting for God to do a miracle in our lives because we are who we are. God is calling us to know him. Turn with me to Matthew, the seventh chapter, very familiar scripture, verse 21 Jesus is saying, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not knoweth the will of, but you have to do something. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's us. And in thy name cast out devils. That, that's our authority. And in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Can we get to the place where we've experienced all of the miracles of God, and yet 
we've not really known God. I, I remember years ago, I've referred to it a lot of times, Brother Bill Davis preached at camp, and he said, the enigma is this, is that there are people who know someone who knows God, but they don't know God. Oh, my wife, she's really close to God, but I don't know God. My pastor, wow, he gets a hold of God on a regular basis, but do you get a hold of God on a regular basis? Do you know him like you should, you see? God didn't come down the mountain. He asked us to come up the mountain. Uh, I so often think about the sin of Jeroboam in the Old Testament. God referred to it so often that he said, you don't have to go up to Jerusalem. We can just have our little get-together here. Less church, less effort. You know, God understands. You're busy. You have other things to do. No, no. You have to put God first in your life. If we are to really know God, it's going to take some effort in seeking after God. And I believe that is, is what happened in, in Paul's life. Paul got to the place where uh, he was tenacious. He wanted to know God more than perhaps anybody in the entire Bible. So if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Again, a very familiar scripture, starting in verse number one, it says, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of, of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, he's talking about himself, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter of such a one, I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And so he's saying, I have more insight with God than perhaps anybody else. He has given me revelations. He has, he has showed me his glory. Taken me to a place. And you know what? Any one of the disciples, any one of those people within the church or in our church could get to the same place if you have the same desire to know God. It wasn't that Paul was so special because he didn't come into this through truth. Glory to God. Amen. A third heaven experience. Amen. Amen. Take a look at uh, Exodus, the 34th chapter, please. Starting in verse number 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. Notice immediately after God gives Moses and insight into who he is, he falls at his feet and worships. As soon as God gives us revelation, as soon as God opens the door to another aspect of his goodness, the first thing that happens is we worship him. I can't tell you how many times as I sat at my desk at home 
and, and, and studied the word, and God showed me something. It just brought me to tears, and, and I started worshiping God. You know, it's because revelations brings a closeness to God. Without that revelation, without that understanding of who he is, what he is willing to do, that he forgave me. Yeah. Hallelujah. That, that who am I that God is mindful of me? That's the attitude of, of David, not, and, and Paul too. I don't look at me like I'm some great thing, but God, let me glory about what God has done for me, you see? Hallelujah. As, uh, as I see these things happen, it just brings me closer to God. And, and these are little individual nuggets that you see for yourself, you know. I wonder how many times people have come to me, let me show you what God showed me. Now, that's exciting, you know. It, it's not just, hey, good message, Pastor, you know. But when you do your own digging, and God reveals something to you, you see, then it gets exciting. Church, there, there should be a spontaneous worship during the preaching when, when some, some revelation or truth. I, I remember in 1980 being at a world conference in, in Israel, and, um, and, and there was great preaching. It was just some of the best and, and there was this little guy, Taclomarian from Ethiopia, and when something happened like that, he would just jump out on the aisle and start dancing and praising God. Because now he knew God better, more intimately than ever before. The, the problem with people is if you don't know God, you can't worship him, you can't live for him. You've got to know him. You've got to see his glory, if you will. If we could view our walk with God like, like a ladder. And each rung of our ladder is the next step in knowing God. And you can decide how high you're going to go on the ladder. You know? And, and we can choose which rung we stay on and which rung we remain on. You can decide you can stay in the church on the second rung of the ladder or the third rung. Or maybe you're not satisfied. You want to go higher with God. You want to climb higher. Know him better than anybody else. Our level of worship is always joined to our level of revelation or knowledge of God. If you have an incredible intimate relationship with God, well, you cannot stop yourself from worshiping God. God, you see, but it's just on a hearsay, a book report. How can you get excited about God? And the reason it's hard to get some Pentecostals to really let go and worship is because they have stayed on a lower level rung of experience and knowledge of God. I've been baptized. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. When's this rapture thing going to happen? You may not be around for it. You know? Yeah, you know, we, we got married, but yeah, I'm not that close to her, you know? Now it's not going to last, folks. You know, the incredible thing is God knows everything about me and he still loves me. <laughs> but I don't know much about him at all. Oh, there will be a day when I'm going to see him, not through a glass, you know, but face to face. Hallelujah. The knowledge of God comes from, from other people's experiences. It just isn't enough. We can't just hear the preaching of God's word without experiencing the expression of it in our own life. You know, there are a lot of people who are just content hearing the stories but never having the experience of the story. The book of Acts is just full of miracles that, well, that's just, just part of it. So many of them haven't even been written down. 
Could God really say to a born-again believer, depart from me, I never knew you? Could that happen to me? Some years ago, I had an opportunity to beat uh, Governor Scott Walker. Um, I went pheasant hunting with him. I had several meetings with him. And, and he even told me about some of the things that he was going through um, in his family. What do you think, Pastor? Now, he wasn't just the name of a governor of Wisconsin anymore, you see. He even gave me his personal cell number. Now, before you think I'm a name dropper, uh, I've had hundreds, even thousands of personal meetings with Jesus. He even gave me his private number so I could call him in the middle of the night. You see, I, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're close. We're close. Hallelujah. I, I don't just consider him the supreme authority of the world, but I consider him as my personal friend, you see. Hallelujah. He even gave me his own name. Folks, I, I don't just want to know about God. I really want to know him. And that takes some effort on my part. Even more than a, a first name basis, I, I'd like a third heaven experience to add to all of the other experiences that I have. If you were just living on that initial experience of your burning bush filled with the Holy Ghost, it's not enough. It's just there to motivate you and to change your lifestyle, to get you out of Egypt. But now once you're out of Egypt, God wants you to get a little closer to him, know him for who he really is. We could be like Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul. You know, incredible. Now, Saul knew about God and had exceptional knowledge of all of the word of God, which was the Old Testament. He he went to the school of Gamaliel. He he knew all about it. He he knew the letters of, of, of the law. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, what did he say? Who art thou, Lord? He knows all of the word of God. He counted the leather because he was a Pharisee. But when he came face to face, he didn't even know who wrote the book. I've been reading your book. I've been zealous for you, God. But I don't know you. I don't know you. Brother Littles talked about the 19th chapter of Acts and the, the... vagabonds who who wanted to cast out a devil. I know Paul, and I know Jesus, but who are you? Because you don't know God. You better not fool around with the things of God if you don't know who God really is. That describes a lot of us before we ever came to Pentecost. We heard all of the stories, but we didn't know the God. We didn't know the author of the book, but there was something in us that wanted to know who Jesus is. I've taught hundreds of Bible studies, and when I get to that lesson of who is Jesus, I've seen people's face light up when they recognize he wasn't the junior God, that he wasn't a part of the trio, but Jesus is God. Hallelujah. You know that 80% of Christianity doesn't even know that Jesus is God? What a privileged people we are. We can't just love the book without meeting the author. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?